Uh, I'm Nicolas Veron at the Institute, and it's my uh, pleasure to introduce this session, the first in the series where we focus on Africa. And uh, we couldn't think of a better combination to discuss uh, banking and finance in Africa than the one we have today with Elzi Ado Awadzi from the Bank of Ghana and Amadou C of the International Monetary Fund. Elzi Ado Awadzi uh, studied at the University of Ghana initially in law, uh, in uh, finance, where she got her MBA in uh, 2000. Uh, she had an early career in private law practice. Uh, she was also early on uh, in public service uh, for six years between 2002 and 2008 as commissioner of the Securities and Exchange Commission of Ghana. Uh, she then went, went back to private uh, practice, studied at Georgetown University Law Center, where she got her degree in 2012. And after that, has worked at the International Monetary Fund as senior counsel in the legal department. Uh, so uh, very familiar with the Washington landscape. But in February 2018, she went back to Ghana as second deputy governor uh, of the central bank and uh, with particular responsibility for financial stability and uh, banking supervision issues, which will be much of our topic today. Amadou C uh, studied uh, in Canada at uh, HEC Montreal and then at McGill University. He got his PhD in finance there in 1997. And since then he's been, uh, I think, basically all of the time at the International Monetary Fund, but also at Brookings, uh, uh, our uh, fellows across the street from the Peterson Institute uh, since 2013. Uh, he's been the author in particular of a book uh, published by Brookings in 2018, Africa Through an Economic Lens, and uh, has occupied a number of um, senior positions at the IMF where he's now an advisor, uh, particularly on African issues. And he joins us, uh, I think, from Dakar today. Uh, so with that, uh, of course, we want to take a pretty broad view of uh, banking and financial issues uh, and uh, financial system issues in Africa. It's, a, it's, it's an incredibly broad issue. So we're going to cover a lot of ground, probably not cover everything, uh, but, uh, but, but I am uh, looking forward to learning a lot from there. And uh, with that, uh, over to you, Elsie. Thank you very much, Nicola. And um, I'm truly honored to be on this um, session today and looking forward to the discussion ahead. So let me go straight to my slides. And I am going to try and make this as quickly as I can. So I've been asked to talk about Africa's evolving banking landscape. And um, to do that, I wanted to cast a broad picture of what the region looks like for the five, 54 distinct jurisdictions, um, often divided in five sub regions. So the Northern part of Africa, um, the Southern part of Africa, Central, East and West. Uh, the currently as two monetary unions um, for um, eight former colonies, French colonies in West Africa, as well as six former colonies in Central Africa, all of whose um, regional currencies are pegged to the euro. And these two monetary unions also function as banking unions with a common regional regulator and supervisor. Um, there are um, about eight regional economic communities existing in the region, all of which are trying to promote regional integration at various levels. So the African banking landscape continues to evolve. Um, policy makers, regulators are dealing with a variety of priorities, some of which I'll be uh, discussing shortly. Uh, in terms of what the bank, banking sector looks like, there are quite a number of small indigenous banks, homegrown banks, um, thrift institutions, um, namely savings and loans companies, microfinance companies, rural and community banks. And then there are the more uh, cross-border banks uh, that often have access to more capital and management expertise from the regional or international group uh, parents or affiliates. Uh, we also have seen a decline in the incidence of state-owned banks um, following a number of privatization efforts as well as uh, reforms to liberalize the financial uh, sector in Africa. Pan-African banks continue to gain more market share 
within the continent, um, working through branches of subsi or subsidiaries, and uh, we're seeing a continu continuous shrinking of the share of international banks um, in the banking sector in the, in the continent. Cross-border payments remain a challenge, even with Pan-African banks operating uh, in a number of jurisdictions. Um, this is due to uh, currency inconvertibility, inc as well as in, uh, lack of interoperable payment systems. I must add, though, that there are early discussions going on on how to create a Pan-African uh, payment system that helps with cross-border currency convertibility. Question, sorry to interrupt on uh, your bullet point on Pan-African banks. Right. Um, in terms of the terminology, by Pan-African banks, I guess you mean those which are headquartered in Africa and international banks would be those that headquartered in the rest of the world, correct? Absolutely. So Pan-African banks, as I refer to here, has become a, a term that is used for banks that are homegrown in Africa. So starting from one African country, uh, registered, incorporated in one African country, regulated in one African country, and then um, branches out by way of branches or subsidiaries across the continent. So these are, are, are banks that are African compared to non-African international banks. Okay, and I'll be showing a few of those. So thanks for, uh, for that question. So um, on this slide, you see a number of um, countries where Pan-African banks operate. So there are currently about um, six or so major ones um, headquartered in Morocco, in Togo, in Nigeria, in Kenya, and South Africa. And these banks are basically spread across the continent. So you find examples where the Ecobank Group, which is headquartered in Togo, in West Africa, um, operates across more than 30 countries in the region. You have a number of South African banks operating um, over, you know, uh, 10 branches or subsidiaries across the region. So I won't go into too much detail, but the slides are here. But this shows you a picture um, of the pace of growth of, of Pan-African banks. Um, and then this goes to Nicolas question. This is a list of major international banks, cross-border banks operating in Africa. These are not African banks. These are banks from Europe, uh, from the US and, and other countries from Asia that operate across a number of African countries as well. Some of these happen also to be globally systemically important as per the Financial Stability Board's designation. Uh, you have the Société Générale, which is a French banking group, City Group, that Standard Chartered Group. There was the Barclays Group, but it's since sold its shares to APSA, South Africa, that operates subsidiaries across the country, and so on and so forth. Um, this is a slide showing you the market share of Pan-African banks versus international banks, non not African banks, as well as indigenous banks. Um, so in Ghana, for example, um, you find that of the 23 banks we have, 10 of them are Pan-African banks in the gray spot over there. Um, nine of them are um, indigenous banks, and then four only are international banks that are not regional banks. Same as the market share that's correspondent to the market share in terms of total assets, uh, with Pan-African banks leading, uh, followed by indigenous banks, Ghanaian grown banks, and then the rest held by international banks. So this shows you a picture of how fast the banking um, sector in, in, uh, in Africa is, is, um, is, is growing, um, driven largely by the advent of Pan-African banks. There are a number of opportunities that has come with this. Uh, the economies of scale, where you have one bank in one country uh, operating now across the region, uh, and the efficiency in terms of pooling of funds to support large projects, especially infrastructure projects within the region. Um, this also helps with facilitating economic integration, particularly now with the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, which has been enforced from May 2020, which is said to be the largest um, trade area, made Africa the large the largest trade area in the world in terms of the number of participating countries. And so basically this is driving more integration, driving uh, more development and driving more competition 
and improved standards of governance and risk management. There are risks, however. Uh, many of these banks have become not only domestically uh, systemically important, but regionally systemically important, meaning that with the failure of one, the, the, economic, uh, the economic stability of the entire region may well be uh, affected just because of just how uh, interrelated these institutions have become with the economies of Africa. There are at the same time different regulatory and supervisory regimes at play in the home and host jurisdictions in Africa. Uh, very little harmonization in terms of banking regulation and supervisory approaches. Very different resolution and crisis management approaches and regimes. And each of these countries is at a different stage of financial sector development, including in particular the safety nets that um, hold in the financial system. So there are a number of cross-border cooperation agreements, uh, arrangements, I should say, in place that help to bring supervisors in the region together, in particular as it relates to Pan-African banks. Um, but you, you see that there's a whole le less, uh, not as much cooperation when it comes to crisis management and resolution. So there's a lot more, you know, joint examinations and supervisory colleges, that kind of thing, but their scope usually does not extend to planning for crisis and actually managing crisis. Um, many, many jurisdictions are still using Basel 1.5. Increasingly, there's, um, there are moves to transition into Basel 2 and 3. South Africa is the only member, is the only country in the region that is a BIS by, uh, Basel Committee FSB member, but more and more uh, jurisdictions in the continent are beginning to form, become part of the Basel Consultative Group and the FSB's Regional Consultative Group. That is helping a little bit to bring all the countries together in terms of what's needed to be done, particularly on crisis, uh, crisis management and uh, crisis preparedness, I should say. So this leads me to how the continent is dealing with a COVID-related shock, at least as it relates to regulating and supervising the banking sector. We're seeing uh, the rise of NPLs, no doubt, as, as credit risks have heightened. Um, at the same time, there isn't a well-developed NPL market, even at the domestic level and then at the regional level. And keep in mind that you have a whole lot more of these banks operating as Pan-African banks. And so it would really be useful if there were like a regional market to deal with NP, the rise in MPL levels. Um, operational risks um, are continuing to rise on account of COVID and supervisors are particularly concerned about this. These, there's the advent of the sovereign bank nexus that is beginning to uh, concern regulators a whole lot uh, as a result of governments having to borrow a lot to deal with the fiscal uh, uh, spending re required for handling the COVID pandemic. Um, at the same time, we're seeing a suspension of on-site examinations um, by many of these countries and joint examinations by host and home supervisory authorities have literally come to an end uh, or at least been suspended in many cases on account of a, uh, of a health crisis. And AML CFT risks continue to mount and we're seeing a lot more adverse listings by the Financial Action Tax Force, the EU, the UK, uh, even in the midst of a pandemic. So supervisors are dealing with the basic issues relating to credit and liquidity risks, operational risk, and having to think of uh, the impact of being blacklisted, especially by the EU, um, as, long, as long as they're on a FATF gray list. And so really the, the issues are very complex. Um, the, a lot of supervisors have adopted the same measures in terms of addressing the, the COVID related risks. And I wouldn't bore you with that because the, these are fairly standard. Um, some regulators are beginning to unwind on the COVID related reliefs they provided. A case in point is Kenya that has recently unwound the capital and liquidity reliefs and other reliefs it provided for the banking sector in Kenya. Um, many others have stayed put uh, in as a result of the third wave that, of the pandemic that is playing out in much of the region. 
um, financial safety nets at this point need to be uh, taken very seriously because there would be potential, there are potential losses and there will be eventual losses in the banking sector in Africa. Uh, but many regulators, many policymakers are not um, dealing with the need to strengthen financial safety nets at this point because there seems to be many other priorities uh, in terms of stabilizing the system. And so there's a bit of a concern as to whether there are enough legal powers in place for early intervention and resolution when the time is right. Um, many of these countries do not have deposit insurance schemes. Banks certainly do not have loss absorbing capacity. So in the midst of a pandemic where the fiscal situation is worsening by the day, there is a real possibility that by the time the pandemic is over, banking sector losses would come to roost and the fiscal authorities may have to do something uh, about it, you know, given the absence of safety nets in place. That um, brings me to the other major phenomenon in Africa, which is the role of technology in the banking system. Uh, without doubt, you know, technology is fast changing the face of banking in Africa. Uh, many banks have gone electronic, uh, and in particular, we see that in the midst of the pandemic, um, a lot of banks have had to just roll out more and more products and services using um, every electronic channel that they can find. Um, some regulators are, have gone on to even license fully you know, digital banks, banks without any physical presence at all, uh, just operating fully uh, on online. Uh, we're seeing a lot more cloud-based banking, which is enabling new capabilities in the sector. And um, there's a lot, there's an increase um, in, in, in the extent to which um, every Tom, Dick and Harry in every corner of the country, of, of, of the continent is uh, able to access financial services because it's actually been made easy. You don't have to walk to a bank branch you know, it comes to you. Uh, in most cases on the back of a mobile phone, um, which many people in the continent have. I think Africa is one is a big, one of the biggest regions when it comes to the uptake of mobile telephony. Um, so the advent of mobile money has been a big, uh, a big game changer in Africa. Uh, this essentially is a result of partnerships between telcos, banks, fintechs, and mobile money agents. Um, essentially, it's a payment instrument with mobile money accounts operating as virtual wallets with which people make payments either to merchants or transfer cash uh, P2P, but increasingly it is also operating as bank account on the phone uh, because, you, uh, you know, with mobile money on a virtual wallet, you could walk to a vendor on the streets and get cash you could actually operate a virtual savings account or a virtual insurance account or an investment account, right? So fintechs are enabling these services with the development of a variety of apps, which anybody at all can use to operate these services. In Ghana, mobile money wallets are fully interoperable with bank accounts as a result of infrastructure available. So if you have a mobile money account, you can move money to your bank account. You can move money from your bank account to your mobile money account. And what a mobile money... Is, yeah. is, is that some things that uh, you find uh, actually widespread? So if you go to Europe, for example, do you feel that Europe or the US is underdeveloped in terms of mobile money compared to what you see at home? I think that Europe and America have not needed to, to, to leapfrog, right, when it comes to pay, you know, electronic payments and all of that. As far back as possible, many people in Europe or America would have had access to a credit card or a debit card or an ATM machine or, you know, the access to bank accounts have never been a problem or at least in more recent times in Europe or America. And if you compare that to Africa, where many people in the rural areas, many people who, um, you know, are in the informal sector, uh, which is a large group, by the way, um, have never had access to a formal bank account. Right. And so this really uh, became, I think, a matter of necessity for Africa more than it ever was for, for America or Europe. And, and that's why I think the, the rate of growth are staggering. 
you know. I, I, I have tons of questions, uh, but, uh, but I want also to leave space for the questions from the right. audience. So if that's okay with you, Elsie will uh, maybe move to uh, Amadou's uh, reactions and, uh, and we'll come back to a number of those uh, issues in the conversation. Would that fly? That's fine. I wanted to show some numbers uh, just to put okay. things in perspective. So if you could give me just a couple of minutes, I'll do that. Um, so basically, uh, this slide shows you the just how big the market is, right? Uh, for example, uh, we're talking about uh, in Ghana and Kenya, 87% uh, or 82% of GDP is held in mobile money wallets. That's, that's significant, right? Uh, you're talking about billions of US dollars in transactions, uh, you know, in, on a monthly basis, uh, you know? So that's, that's really staggering. And like I said, this is a matter of necessity. Um, and, uh, you know, this goes to the point, Amadou, about um, Africa really leading in, in the growth of mobile money, just purely as a matter of necessity. Okay, and, and so these are some of the numbers that show you. This shows you the growth uh, across the, the, the continent. Uh, this shows you that while uh, mobile money accounts are increasing, formal bank accounts are beginning to increase in tandem because once the individual has become used to operating uh, a bank account, a, a mobile money account, they are now more likely to walk into a bank branch okay, to operate a formal banking account. And banks are beginning to lend to the informal sector, even on mobile money. So they're drawing them into the banking sector increasingly. So that's solving a big problem in terms of financial inclusion. Um, so on that basis, I will leave that. There are actually a number of risks also um, as regulators continue to find out how to um, further enable this phenomenon uh, while at the same time curbing the risks that arise with it. And then I'd like to share some of that later on um, during the Q&A, uh, Nicola. Thank you. Thank you so much. Amadou? Yes, thank you, uh, Nicola. Um, I have uh, the difficult task of following uh, LZ, who, who uh, had a really a tour de force uh, in uh, less than 10 minutes, giving such an excellent uh, overview of the key um, uh, trends and developments in uh, African banking. Um, so uh, thank you for that. So I just want to touch upon very quickly, maybe five issues. The first one is uh, on Pan-African banks. Um, you know, there's a very uh, little research on the... Um, area and then I would encourage uh, if there are any um, um, people listening to us in academia and so on to spend time on it. Uh, I'm aware of a paper in the Journal of Banking and Finance by uh, Kamga, Murinda and Sumare who are asking, well, you know, does the expansion of Pan-African Bank enhance its stability or increase its fragility, right? Are banks going to go into riskier activities or less risky? You know, this traditional question when it comes to competition. Uh, with some colleagues at the IMF, we've looked at uh, how uh, Pan-African, whether Pan-African banks uh, behave differently from foreign banks. And we looked at the special case where, um, you know, you have a negative price oil shock. And we do find that um, they behave counter-cyclically. And that's what some, the, for example, the CEO of EcoBank would claim. So this is an interesting area of research. But uh, as Elsie uh, mentioned also, you know, very difficult issues of group level supervision. Uh, how about spillover, right? Uh, you know, you, you can have one small country where a small subsidiary of a pan African bank is systemically important from that country's perspective. So that's, that's quite interesting also. And finally, the de-risking uh, that LZ mentioned is also a really, um, I would say, an issue. Um, the cost of compliance for, from, from foreign banks uh, can be very high and sometimes they, like we've seen with Barclays, they just leave the continent. So how are Pan-African Bank or are Pan-African Bank filling the gap or how different are they? So I think lots of questions that I have. Another issue, um, I think LZ did a good job covering the COVID-related regulatory supervisory response. Um, we are all asking ourselves what happens when the temporary support will be lifted? 
And I think that's, that's uh, we have, and do we have the tools to manage the risk that we will identify? But I will just also mention three government banking nexus in the, on the continent. The other one is often uh, government uh, areas are also leading to NPLs. Uh, so that's, that's, that's kind of a very important link. The other link also maybe a bit indirectly is the state-owned enterprises and also uh, their roles uh, often in increasing NPLs. And finally, it's the, um, uh, you know, the government bonds, uh, as the investor base is, domin is bank dominated, uh, we don't have, and the yields are quite high. The bonds can be refinanced at central bank. You often have banks uh, increasing their portfolio of local government bonds. And often also the, the weight is a zero weight, zero risk weight. On financial technology in Africa, we've seen the high growth of mobile payments. We have the, we've seen the gains on, in, in terms of financial inclusion. So far in terms of financial stability, no issue. We've looked at the e-money flows and so on. But one key issue is though, you know, as what I would call the value chain, right? We go for payments to savings like the mobile wallets in Ghana. Uh, and sometimes then we go to hopefully we go to more lending that will raise some consumer protection issues that we can see that in Kenya sometimes with the high cost. But then you want to also move to SME lending, uh, working capital lending, and hopefully some 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 um, push you know and on, on productivity gains and so on. So so that really uh, there's there's a lot uh, that the, the fintech and mobile. Uh, technology can help, but we, we still want to go through all this value chain. Uh, cyber risk, always an issue. It's always flagged by all the supervisors. Another thing is cross-border payments. You know, apart, it's true we have two uh, monetary uh, unions, but we have diff many, many, many different uh, currencies and um, uh, uh, trade settlements is very difficult. Sometimes you have to trade in dollars or in euro. So what's the role of mobile payments when it comes to cross-border transactions? Uh, rec tech, sub tech, we've seen a lot of interesting things, for example, by the South African Reserve Bank with this project, uh, HOHA, I hope I, I pronounced it uh, correctly, uh, which is a DLT based wholesale payment. And now they're moving to another, to a second phase to look at the policy and regulatory implications. Uh, in terms of financial inclusion, one trend that I still am seeing, I was kind of surprised because, you know, the, 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 we are discussing less and less about microfinance institution. And I've seen some microfinance institutions that did very well and then uh, that are, have even become banks. I've seen in Cameroon a microfinance institution that did an IPO in the stock market and became a bank. So very interesting too. Finally, on climate risk, yes, uh, green swans issue. We have to start looking at the buildup of climate risks on ba banks' okay. balance sheet. Maybe it's time for us to look at uh, um, the, the nationally determined contribution, you know, Bankers, central bankers started to look at what uh, the government is thinking in terms of uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation. And finally, I would, would finish with one risk. You know, it's always about identifying risk and measuring and managing them. But we've seen a lot of political risk increasing in the continent. And how uh, it's a question is how banks are coping. And sometimes you would be surprised that they can be resilient, as we've seen, for example, during the Cote d'Ivoire uh, crisis, where some bankers were telling us that. Uh, they manage the crisis pretty well. So I'll just stop there. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And thanks again, Elsie, for a very nice presentation. Thanks, uh, Amadou. And uh, as uh, I, I think the word you used of uh, tour de force applies to both presentations. So thanks to both of you for that. Um, since you mentioned a lot of uh, FinTech, I uh, realize I should declare a special interest because I'm an investor in a a venture capital fund that has investments in African fintech, especially fair money in Nigeria. So I should uh, disclose my interest. I don't think they create a conflict. Um, I have a, a I have a ton of questions, and I already see a number of them in the audience. So so I will start with one which is coming from Joel Henderson, and uh, maybe first with you, Amadou, and um, and then Elsie, if you want to comment which is about the special role of my own home country. France is, uh, as uh, Joel reminds us, quite involved in about 14 African economies uh, and in his words, uh, which lack monetary sovereignty. Is this stabilizing or undermining the development of the banking sector in these countries? 
You know, the, the, I think one, one should look at it from a dynamic perspective uh, because, you know, we've seen the entry of Pan-African Bank. So that means that at some point, the Pan-African banks had enough, um, uh, had, had achieved a, a size and had a proposition value that were, that gave them the confidence to go and compete against uh, these French foreign, 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 these French banks that have been the incumbents for a long time. So we'll see how this competition is dealing with, but I think in many markets, French banks have lost um, market share. Then you have also, I think we should also think, like if you take, non-banks like Orange, right? The telecom company who is very active in mobile payments in uh, the WAMU and the SEMAC with even cross-border payments within the eight countries of the WAMU, for example. And I understand they had applied for a, for a banking license. I don't know if they've gotten it. So I think this is part of uh, a very dynamic uh, environment and uh, with of course pros and cons, yeah. Is it time for France for to completely leave the scene and leave the support of uh, African monetary unions to the IMF? <laughs> I leave that question to Elsie. <laughs> that was on purpose, Elsie. <laughs> I might be right back to you. <laughs> no, no. You're, but you're I... neutral. Yeah, you you don't have a dog in that fight. No, no, but I think it's, as I would say, I wouldn't single out France. You will see, for example, Moroccan banks also coming in, accompanying uh, Moroccan companies that are coming in into the region. So I think it's open, there is competition. And I think we should just think about what are really the, from the, 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 the key impact, you know, do we have financial stability or not? The consumer, are consumers benefiting from lower interest rates or not? Are companies, SMEs having more access to credit or not? So I think that that should be the goal of uh, the, 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 the questions. Elsie, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, if I just wanted, to, I wanted to add, I think the question, the original question had to do with uh, whether the influence of France uh, in the region is stabilizing or destabilizing for the countries involved in the monetary unions with France. Um, I think that the arrangements that these um, CFA countries, we call them, um, have with France so, sort of enables them to peg their currencies um, to the euro. Uh, and that has provided some stability for those economies. Um, as to whether that helps in sort of creating a more integrated African uh, economic region, I think that's a separate matter. And there are conversations going on in terms of uh, how some of these countries can work better together. Uh, in terms of developing uh, a more robust uh, monetary union uh, across the region. Um, and so those conversations will play out. But for now, I think that uh, I don't see that the influence of France is destabilizing in the sense that it's disrupting uh, regional supervision of these institutions um, or that uh, it, it affects the, the stability of African financial systems. I, I, I haven't seen the evidence and I haven't read of anything that would point to that, but I think it's more of a national uh, and a jurisdiction by jurisdiction issue as to how the relationship with France works and, and should work and, and ought not to I work. Cannot, I cannot resist asking a question about supervision specifically, coming back to the banking piece of that. Uh, when you're in contact with uh, the supervisory authorities at the, at the home country level, do you interact more with the ECB or with French authorities? So it depends. Um, if it's a, a Pan-African bank, then the interaction is with the host supervisor in Africa, right? So if it's a Moroccan bank, uh, we're dealing with a bank, Al Maghreb, yeah, which is a regulator. If it's a South African bank, we're dealing with a South African Reserve Bank. If it's a French bank, like a Société Générale, uh, we're dealing with the French authorities uh, as well as with the ECB, okay? Um, so the, at that level, that's how it works because it's a French bank and it's subject to EU jurisdiction, um, uh, you know, part of the, of the single uh, supervisory mechanism. We deal first with the bank, bank de France and then we deal also with the ECB. But if it's a Pan-African bank, we're dealing with regional uh, with uh, with African home jurisdictions. Amadou, do you want to comment on that? 
No, I was just going to mention quickly uh, the, 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 this, this issue of cross Pan-African bank and, and common currency. Uh, so we've looked at SWIFT data, for example, and look at the, the, the transaction, the MT103, and uh, you would see that um, the, in the WAMU, there's a lot of uh, uh, cross-border transaction in TFA Frank, but in the CIMA countries, which also has a common currency, you have less. Right, and then in, you would have in the East Africa um, less than in the WAMU. So I think this issue of cross-border um, transaction and, and trade finance and so on is something a very important issue to, to think about. So one thing that struck me is, um, I mean, I, I have to uh, disclose my general uh, lack of knowledge about Africa and certainly complete lack of underground knowledge. But we read a lot about Chinese investment in Africa and Chinese presence, and also, of course, sovereign lending, uh, which is a major issue. I was uh, intrigued by the fact that in your list of international banks, there, is, there was no Chinese bank uh, featuring. Uh, LZ, can you comment a little bit more on uh, whether you think there will be a going forward presence of the Chinese banking system in, uh, in, uh, around Africa, or is that something that's simply not happening? Uh, thank you. So, yes, um, China has a real big influence, most um, in the financial system, most of it through lending to the sovereigns in Africa, uh, through a number of, of Chinese banks. For example, the China Exim Bank is one, uh, one example, but these are all offshore, I mean, in China. But there is um, also a significant uh, Chinese presence in African's banking system. So if I were to go back to the slide, um, that if you'd permit me, that has the international, um, that has the, okay, I do not have, I do not have the, um, I, there was a slide, okay, please forgive me. Um, no problem. So if I were to go back to the discussion on Pan-African banks, um, you, you would um, have seen that in South Africa, we had, there's a big bank called the Standard Bank Group. It has quite a number of subsidiaries across the, the continent. And there's a big Chinese bank in there, the ICB, uh, so the ICBC or something like that. The ICBC right. has like 20% of Standard it, Bank it or has, something? It has 20% of Standard Bank. And actually it's also a GSIP uh, right. designated by the FSB as such. And that bank has, if you look, for example, at the small jurisdictions in Southern Africa, operating outside South Africa, um, most of their banking sector is dominated by Standard Bank, right? Uh, and so you do see just the share influence of China um, exhibited through a 20% uh, equity stake of, of this Chinese, of, of, of the Standard Group, of the Standard Bank Group. Uh, and so there are there are there in more subtle ways than uh, than than is visible, but uh, they're still there. Right. So uh, you mentioned the uh, features that may become financial stability risk in terms of the bank sovereign nexus and the fact that banks hold a lot of sovereign debt. And it, you 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 said uh, that it's generally zero risk weighted. I think Amadou, you mentioned that. Yeah. Are there exceptions to this? Are there cases where a uh, home country Sovereign debt is uh, not zero risk weighted, or is that a universal uh, feature? That's a question from Marcel Magnus. Um, is it? I could answer that unless Amadou wants to answer that. Uh, from my experience, it's mostly zero zero rated. Uh, speaking for Ghana as well, I don't know though. From discussions we've had in the region uh, amongst us as regulators and supervisory authorities, that some countries are thinking of changing that. In particular, as we're seeing more and more banks. Uh, invest in government paper. So, so how, is it, how has this worked in past episodes of uh, default? Because there have been a number of credit events in Africa over the last 10, 20 years. Uh, how, how have these uh, bank holdings of sovereigns played out in recent episodes? They would, um, if banks would, would definitely also be affected by any restructuring uh, or defaults, yes. And I'm not aware that the holding the the supervisory ratings would have changed only as a result of that. But yes, uh, to the extent that banks are bondholders, uh, they would be impacted by any defaults or any restructuring. Um, what we're seeing now is the fact that we've seen an exit 
of a lot of foreign investors uh, on account of COVID and the fact that US interest rates are beginning to rise and the banking sectors in Africa are playing a major role of stepping in to provide the much needed funding. So um, Nicola, as risky as it might even sound given uh, debt sustainability concerns, the African business environment is quite a difficult one. And therefore uh, sovereign risk certainly becomes less of a risk compared to SME risk, for example, you know, and therefore banks naturally will try to get in there. Um, you will find that in the midst of the pandemic, the banking sector has made a lot of profits thanks to their increase in investments in government paper. Uh, and so some, and at the same time, you're seeing a slowdown in credit to the private sector because there's a lower demand for credit from businesses impacted. Um, and so the banks are sort of, you know, filling the space with government paper, making good money out of it. And regulators are now beginning to say, well, it's helping, but... Uh, we need to do something about this before it gets too bad. Typical capital levels uh, of, for example, banks in Ghana, what, uh, what is the typical uh, risk weighted capital ratio for the banks under your supervision? We have a 10% capital adequacy ratio uh, with a 3% buffer uh, that we, want, we, we need banks to hold. So all in all, 13%. In the midst of the pandemic, we cut the buffer by 150 basis points. So they're currently holding a minimum of about 11.5% in terms of capital. Amadou, obviously, you spend a lot of time thinking about all these issues. So, uh, so how do you view these, uh, these aspects of the, the nexus? So I think uh, it, I, I agree with what LZ said. So I think um, there's this, this a short-term issues uh, that we need, we need to, to, to think about when it comes to the, um, the, the, the banks uh, purchasing so much um, um, sovereign bonds. The other thing also that makes them buy sovereign bonds is that um, in some countries, uh, at least in the, I, I work on the SEMA countries, you can get, refinance, get refinancing at the central bank um, with, your, with your government uh, paper. So it's quite attractive. But I think we also should think uh, medium term uh, and to long term and say, how do we broaden the investor base for, uh, for, for sovereign market? And the usual culprits are, you know, the pension funds and the insurance funds. And then often less attention is, 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 is spent on that. Of course, you know, um, pension fund, the, the goal is to ensure that, um, you know, old age uh, pensioners are, you know, uh, have um, security. So that's, the, but given that constraint and, you know, how is this investment policy making them, um, uh, instead of investing so much in real estate, for example, invest in sovereign bonds. Same, uh, life insurance in many countries is not as developed uh, and, and, and it's more, mostly property and casualty. How do you develop a life insurance? So, so, but um, there is money, um, and also there's cross-border money. If you take the, the, the South African pension, it's PIC, I think, which is really huge um, from an African perspective. There's also some some op opportunities there. Um, but I think um, you know it's it's something that we talk about. But I think it's really time as as the market is increasing to really think about how do we really have this. Um, uh, investor base. Of course, also the role of foreign investors is, is something, but of course we have to manage the risks in Ghana. Is, is... So I, I will take a question. Yeah, uh, sorry, Elsie. No, I'll take a question from uh, Carlos Carpi, um, who was asking again about China and the Belt and Road Initiative uh, and the, the financial safety net aspect of this. Is there is there any, I mean, we, we know there's a lot of sovereign lending by Chinese um, uh, policy banks. Uh, you mentioned Exim, Exim banks, the Chinese uh, uh, development bank. But is there also direct uh, safety net intervention by the People's Bank of China in terms of uh, macro um, support or, or, or reassurance in terms of, you know, swap lines or anything? Or, or is that something that at this point doesn't exist in Africa? So there is a, there's a, there are a number of swap arrangements uh, at the individual uh, central bank level with with the uh, the People's Bank of China, and so that that arrangement is going on. It, it isn't a continent wide arrangement, 
Um, so some banks have entered into that arrangement because we're beginning to find that a lot of the foreign exchange activity from US dollar to local currency or vice versa, local currency into US dollar foreign exchange transactions are really to be able to change, uh, to be able to access markets uh, in China. So traders and other importers go to China and they would want to go, uh, you know, transact business in US dollars when they could easily have transacted that the kind of business in, uh, you know, Raminbi. And so more and more central banks in Africa are beginning to explore uh, and training to swap arrangements with the central bank in, uh, in China to say, we don't want uh, traders or importers to go through the US dollar <coughs> in their dealings with China. Uh, but there isn't a standing arrangement for the whole region. Um, <clears throat> and, and so that's as far as it is. And, and the Ghanaian, uh, some Chinese banks are also uh, intermediating in that space, you know, and training to sort of arrangements with central banks to be able to reach the central bank of China uh, in terms of uh, arranging swaps. But, but that's as far as it goes for now. That's quite significant already, no? Uh, and uh, and how, when when did that start? Actually, when uh, when when did that kind of um, dynamic become significant from your perspective in Ghana? In the last in the last um, maybe four years, three to four years, I would say. Right, it's becoming more and more uh, a phenomenon in the last three to four years. Amadou, do you want to comment on this? No, no, no. I no. For, for me, it's again, just again. I know I'm I'm starting to sound like a broken record, but as you know, we having the trade integration even within Africa. Okay, Africa, China is the largest uh, African tra trader with Africa, so this this is of course important. Uh, but also going forward, as we are building this trade agreement, this issue of. Uh, cross-border um, and um, settlement and cross-border trading within Africa, as we have so many currencies, I think we, we really, really need to, to have a, a common uh, initiative there. I know there are some regional initiatives, but we, we, we really need to work on that. Um, on that, if I may add, Nicola, um, there is an, there's um, some exploration going on um, led by the African Union uh, with the um, African Exim Bank leading, uh, basically to help to um, build what, what has been called the Pan-African Payment System and Settlement uh, Infrastructure. And that's, ex that's, that's meant to do exactly that, basically help with cross-border settlements that would aid trade. You cannot have a free trade area uh, for, for 54 countries if you don't have currency speaking to each other. And so there's there's beginning to be some work uh, in that direction. How far we're going to go with that and how long it's going to take, um, no one knows, but at least it looks like things are looking in the right direction. And indeed we have a question from Chilizani Fieri about that. So do you, can, do, do you have a sense of any forthcoming milestones on this or it's still kind of undefined? It's still very early yet. It's still very early yet. There's a lot of work has to be done. Uh, you're dealing with very different systems, even infrastructure wise. Um, and then all of the legal arrangements that need to go in place to make this happen. Rene Smith is asking whether there's any publicly available documentation on this. I guess it's on the African Development Bank website. Uh, perhaps you can look at the African Union um, or the African Exim, Exim Bank uh, website. Might have some okay. information on that. So okay. here you go, Rene. And uh, actually also from Rene Smith, but also from Marcel Magnus. I, I have a number of questions which I suspect, and I'm probably in the same bucket, uh, are inspired by the comparison between Pan-African banks and what we have in Europe with the efforts toward banking union. So can you give us a sense of both... You, you already mentioned very briefly deposit insurance, the state of deposit insurance in Africa, both on a national basis and any discussion of uh, cross-border, if there is any such thing, and also um, discussions about cross-border supervision beyond the existing monetary unions, if there is any, uh, is the discussion only about, you know, coordination and supervisory colleges, or are there any conversations about something that would be more binding and, uh, and, and would be in a way more going in the direction of tackling the fundamental issues uh, raised by Pan-African banks, especially in terms of uh, crisis management. 
Okay, so very briefly, um, yes, we there are quite a number of things going on. We there are only a few countries in Africa with deposit insurance schemes. Um, I think probably the oldest would be Nigeria, and then we have you have Kenya, you have Zimbabwe, um, a couple more Ghana. We set us up um, in November twenty nineteen. Uh, after resolving 420 financial institutions uh, and the government having to pay for, for that between 2017 and 2019, uh, early 2019. Um, so many African countries are not having, even South Africa, that's a member of the FSB, uh, is now working towards establishing one. So that, that just shows you, uh, and South Africa is home country to a number of major uh, regional banks. So there's a, a paucity of deposit insurance schemes and even where they exist, they're very small um, and not able to do much. Um, there certainly isn't a regional one. And where unlike the EU in the sense that we don't have a monetary union that cuts across the entire region, we certainly do not have a banking union that cuts across the, the entire region. And therefore it, there isn't a mandate uh, as you do have in the EU. There isn't a mandate for every country to have in place a deposit insurance scheme um, and, and all of that. So it's work in progress. It's work in progress. And um, I think the earlier every country had one, uh, it will be helpful. But again, um, at the level of the, um, of the African Association of Central Banks, the, and then at the re sub-regional levels, there's a lot of conversation about how to make the African safety net, uh, you know, a reality basically, in particular to support the, the operations of Pan-African banks. But, but for now, we don't have any regional safety nets. Um, in terms of cross-border supervision, it's purely voluntary at this point and mainly based on MOUs. Um, and then for those involved in the regional, in the monetary unions, like the UEMOA in the CEMAC, they have more of a binding arrangement for, because there's actually just one regulator in each of those monetary unions. But for the non-monetary union jurisdictions, uh, it's purely voluntary and, and it's mainly meetings and supervisory college meetings, joint examinations from time to time. Uh, again, the Association of Central Banks of Africa has made this uh, a regional topic for discussion, um, talking about how do we make this a little bit more binding across the continent, but it's still early for now. Simon, do what? Uh, what are the spaces we should watch in this space? Uh, it, you know, I, I think Elsie covered it all. Uh, so maybe the countries with uh, with monetary union could could act uh, uh, quicker. Um, but there's always, you know, uh, the issue of who pays. Uh, and then uh, sometimes uh, it's, I guess, the, 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 how, how do we, uh, what's the architecture through which, uh, you know, when, when uh, the funds will need to be paid, uh, you know, so ministries of finance typically, you know, with the fiscal situation that we have, um, look at this uh, with, with, with uh, worry, some, some, I mean, it's worrisome. And so I think the funding is a key issue. Uh, what, what's the optimal um, um, uh, funding of this deposit insurance and how it works. If we can, there's a political economy angle, I would say. Yeah. And of course, uh, in the EU, you mentioned it as a as a benchmark, but they haven't really sorted that out either. So uh, <laughs> I guess everybody is learning at this point. Um, I have a question, which is not strictly about banking. So expanding a bit our topic, about regional financial centers. This is, of course, some things that governments always want to promote. Everybody wants to have a financial hub on their territory, and there have been a number of uh, attempts over the years and even the decades that, you know, having some uh, centralization for Africa, also from offshore but nearby financial centers, not, the, not just those in Europe, but also Mauritius or Dubai or uh, uh, the like. So, so can you give us a sense of is there any kind of network um, shaping up or is it the case that apart from the important development of Pan-African banks, which you uh, presented us, uh, otherwise finance is not really clustered uh, in a particular place? Uh, if you can expand a bit on this, maybe Elsie first. 
Um, yes, so you're right. Mauritius has been a big uh, regional financial center, if you will, uh, also operate a big offshore financial sector uh, center. Um, and then perhaps South Africa, in a sense, I mean, I wouldn't call it a regional financial center, but, but so the South African banking system is really uh, significant. It's really big. It's really major. Uh, it, it, it's really, uh, uh, if you will, indirect, informally, it's a real uh, source of funding, right, even across the, the continent. Um, Ghana has had dreams of becoming a regional financial center for, for many years. Uh, in fact, we introduced uh, offshore banking in 2004 by amendments to our Banking Act, where we created a special class uh, for offshore banks. I, at the time, Barclays Bank was the only bank that applied and received a license to operate as a bank in uh, an offshore bank. Uh, and the tax regime along that was, was developed, but it didn't really, it didn't take off much. So even Barclays gave up its license. More recently, the, the, the finance ministry has, um, has talked about reintroducing the idea. Uh, and so it's still at the very exploratory stages. But I think the idea is for Ghana to want to become a regional financial center in the very near future. And so, uh, good luck to us. It's up to you, uh, Amadou, on this? No, I, I would just say that, I mean, it's a, a lot of countries have this ambition. I would just say maybe that to think, it could be useful to think about the value chains. So for example, I don't know if the statistics are true, but I've been told that there are more uh, accountants per capita in uh, Mauritius than in, in the UK. So, you know, this is this whole thing of, you know, the accounting, the, um, the, the payment system, the infrastructure, and so on. Uh, at the end of the day, I mean, you could see, for example, with Brexit, uh, uh, whether, you know, banks are leaving London or moving to Paris or not, and so on. I, I think there are lessons for us also to see, like, what attracts these, these financial institutions. And I, I think there's a whole ecosystem, basically. So, you mentioned, of course, Right. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I would just also yeah. to think about Casablanca also or... Uh, right. Actually, that was my question, so, yeah. Right, right. Um, and I just wanted to add that increasingly, uh, regional financial centers are also becoming a bit of a concern to the Financial Action Tax Force in terms of AML CFT risks. And so that, uh, that unnecessarily places a lot of uh, a country and a lot of scrutiny. Um, with, with a fear of uh, illicit financial flows and all of that. And so that is something that countries must take into account uh, in developing a regional financial center and, and basically how to assure investors and, and counterparties of, um, you know, of, of, of financial integrity standards uh, in the operation of such a center. Um, Amadou was just mentioning Casablanca before cutting himself off. Uh, is, is that something comparable to South Africa or not of the same nature? Um, I, I would say that, um, you know, if you look at the, 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 the energy through which Moroccan firms are really expanding through the Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and some big ones, like you take OCP, Office Sherifia and Phosphate, which is huge, uh, one of the largest phosphate company in the world. And, and you see the banks, also the Moroccan banks coming in. I think you can see some kind of uh, strategy really uh, to accompany the, 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 the companies with the financing. Uh, so, and maybe even be a hub for, 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 for Europe. Is it something you see from Ghana or uh, not really? Um, no, nothing, nothing to add to that. So uh, we're getting close to the hour. I have a last question, uh, which is kind of open-ended, um, but uh, it was mentioned that South Africa, you mentioned, Elsie, that South Africa is the only uh, African country which is represented in the Financial Stability Board in the Basel Committee. Um, is there any chance that the global system of standard setting could become uh, more inclusive and, and, and have more direct representation of Africa? How do you see uh, that, uh, that dynamic? And, uh, or, or are people in Africa entirely cynical about this? If people, <clears throat> excuse me, people, people in Africa will be particularly delighted to 
uh, to hear that, Nicola, you're thinking about this, uh, because we believe it's very important. Uh, I think the time has come where we need to, democ uh, we need to democratize the global financial uh, architecture a little bit more. Uh, Africa um, has become a major force to reckon with, uh, not just in terms of economically, but also its financial system. And frankly, the day when we thought, the days when we thought Africa's financial system was just, you know, so small and too insignificant, I think are over. Um, we are a part of the global financial system. There are spillovers and spillbacks um, that affect all of us. And it will be very helpful if we are at the table and also bring in to bear some practical experiences on the ground. We can actually learn from each other, you know, um, and also we can help to shape uh, more credible rules, rules that work for all. Uh, and so that's as much as I'll say for now, but I think the scope for, uh, for the global financial system and the standard setting bodies being a little bit more inclusive and Africa stands ready to, to participate fully. Thank you. And I would, I would personally add, add as a European streamlining and consolidation of European representation, especially within the Eurozone. Um, I'm going to do any final remarks on this. Yeah. No, I think LZ put it very well. I think the key issue is that, you know, there's this issue that when you're not on the table, you're on the menu. So we have to think about uh, unintended consequences, right? When uh, rules are, global rules are being taken, when we're talking about GCBs and so on, we really have to think about unintended consequences. The objective might be good, but maybe there is some phasing needed and so on. I might say, my, I'm at the African Department at IMF, but we have a whole department, um, the International Capital and Markets Department. Uh, I think where, uh, I mean, they're very receptive to the views of their African constituents. And uh, I, I, I think also that's a conduit through which um, the African uh, membership can push uh, towards uh, avoiding unintended. Uh, negative unintended consequences. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Elzi and Amadou. Uh, this was a very thought-provoking conversation. Uh, I learned a lot. I hope our audience did as well. Uh, and uh, it uh, gives me more impetus to uh, put Africa not on the table, but uh, but uh, around uh, on on the uh, on the agenda really for uh, our work at the Peterson Institute and specifically this series. Uh, so, um, so I say, um, uh, uh, um, I, I'm going to say it in French, au revoir, and not, uh, and, and not, uh, uh, it, there, there will be other steps of that discussion. Uh, the next session of our series will be on August 20th. Uh, it's a Friday for once. It will be a different geographical focus. We uh, move from the very vast continent of Africa to the comparably small country of Switzerland, but that's also an important piece of the global financial se sector. And we will have Daniela Stoffel of the Swiss Ministry of Finance and Daniel Heller, uh, who uh, used to be at Peterson Institute uh, and is now back uh, in, um, in Zurich. Uh, meanwhile, have a great uh, time in summertime. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all uh, back at the financial statement series at the Peterson Institute. Thank you very much. And thanks especially very warmly to our two speakers. Thank you so much, Thank Nicola. You. Thank you, Elsie. Thank, Thank you, Nicola. Bye, Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.